Hi, April. How are you? Hi, I'm fine. How are you? All right. Are we going to do two sections tonight? Yep. We're going to get it are, done. Are we going to do the review on Monday? Yes. Um, uh, but I'll, I'll have it to you before then. Like you're going to post it on the, yes. so we can print it out and do it, try it? Yep. Yep. Uh, do we have to take our final Wednesday or can we take it Friday? Does that make um, sense? Uh, I can't, what did I do last time? time? <laughs> um, you may have to do it Wednesday. I'll make sure I give you plenty of time. Um, uh, let me... I, I, I wanted to tell you about, I, I, I'm on, I do have a, a certified disability on the campus there. Okay. And if I could get a couple extra minutes, I'd really appreciate it. I'm just real slow when it comes to math. And, uh, oh, yeah. Well, you, last says, time I know, I didn't give you all enough time. So I'm going to give you all like four hours this time. <laughs> so. Yeah, well, I, I would appreciate it. And if you need to check it, it is in the, the Ivy Tech, uh, you know, center. If they have it posted, that I, you know, that I'm, I am on this, you know, disabled. So. Right. Do you oh. have to go to campus to take it? No, no. Uh, okay. As long as it's, uh, you know, over the internet, like you have it set up. No, I don't. Okay. Uh, unless it's a uh, uh, proctored something that has to be proctored. And I don't believe this is unless you, mm -mm. yeah. Okay. Nope. Nope. It's not proctored. Um, let me just double check and see when Ivy Tech's grades are due. Um, well, however you want to do it, it was just a question. I mean, you know, I, I've had this much time, so if it's Wednesday, that's cool with me. Okay, because I was going to open it up like at four o'clock on, you know, Wednesday when class normally starts and leave it open for four or five hours. That sounds good to me. Okay. Okay. To make sure y'all have plenty of time to, to get through it. Okay. Back to Zoom. Share screen. All right, um, my internet went down, so I'm actually, no, it's, it went down earlier. I hope it doesn't go down again. I'm connected to it now. I don't know what the problem was because I was working off my hotspot, but anyway, we'll see how this goes. Hope it doesn't go down. It went down yesterday too in my neighborhood. All right, section 6.7. Um, covers financial models. Basically, we're gonna work with um, simple interest and compound interest. And there's the four objectives that we're gonna do. So we're gonna start with the future value of a lump sum of money, and we're gonna start with simple interest. Um, the simple interest formula is I equals PRT. This is a formula you may wanna jot down before you take your final, so you have it. Um, I is the interest that you earn capital P, P is the, um, the amount of money that you either borrow or you um, invest, one or the other. So P, that's, it's called principal. Um, the important thing to remember about this is that time, which is T, has to be in years. So if they give you give it to you in months, you have to convert months to years. They give it to you in days, days to years. And then um, R is your interest rate. And um, if they give you like 5%, you cannot use a number five. You have to change that to 0 0.05, five out of 100. So just remember time has to be in years. So if they were to say um, 12 months, 
you wouldn't use the number 12, you would use the number one for one year. All right, so I just went ahead and grabbed a couple of my math lab examples. Um, it wants you to find uh, the simple interest owed for the use of the money is, so you're going to grab the simple interest formula, I is equal to P R T, and P is the amount of money that you invest, or in this case, borrow. The 7,000, that goes right here where the P is. And then it's gonna be times the interest rate. Well, the interest rate was 6.5%, but you have to see that as 0 0.065. And then here comes the time, and it says the time is 15 months. Well, there's 12 months in a year, so if you wanted to convert it, you would take your 15 months and divide it by 12, and that comes out to be 1.25 years. So down here, I'm going to have 1.25. And then it's just me and my calculator. And when I'm done, it does say round to the nearest cent, which would be the hundredths place. So when I multiply um, and round off to the nearest penny, I get $568.75. So if you invested $7,000 or sorry, borrowed, <laughs> they're borrowing $7,000 in 15 months you have to pay back all seven grand plus an additional five hundred and sixty eight dollars and seventy five cents that's what they charge you for borrowing the money just like renting a car if you rent a car you have to give the car back plus you have to pay the rental fee so you're basically renting seven grand you got to give the seven grand back <laughs> and then the rental fee is $568.75, they call it interest. All right, and then this one says, if a person borrows 2,200 and after three months pays off the loan in the amount of 2,222, what, I don't know why this popped up, uh, what per annum rate of interest was charged? Okay, first things first, I have to figure out what my interest is. So I'm going to start with the amount of money. I borrowed 2200 and I paid back $2,222. So if I subtract it, I paid back an additional $22. That's my interest. So you go back to the interest is equal to principal times rate times time, and the $22 goes right here. The principal we were told was this number here. That's what they borrowed, 2200. You are looking for R, and then time is three months. Okay, three months out of 12. It's not even a whole year. It's only three out of 12, which is a quarter of a year, 0.25 years. So my time is 0.25. Now, I'm gonna simplify the right side. Since you've got 2200 times R times 0.25, you can go ahead and multiply the 2200 times the 0.25. And that's going to be 550 R. And then to solve for R, I'll divide both sides by 550. Cancels out there, gives me R. When I get, when I divide, that actually divides evenly, I get 0 0.04. Now, up here it says round to the nearest tenth as needed. And you'll notice that they give the answer in percent form. 
0.04 is not in percent form. To get it in percent form, you're going to have to move the decimal two places to the right. Just like on the last problem, we had to move it two places to the left. They gave us, what was it? They gave us 6.5%. We had to change it to 0 0.065. Well, here you're getting 0 0.04, so you got to change it to a percent. And there's actually no rounding because when I put the decimal point behind the four, there's nothing after it. So 4% is my answer. And that's simple interest. Um, here's another example. I'm not going to go through it. I'm just going to leave it in the PowerPoint if you want to look at it. Oh, wait, no, I do need to. I'm sorry. Okay, this one leads us into compound interest. Um, a credit union pays interest of 2% per annum compounded quarterly. When they say quarterly, that means four times a year on a certain savings plan. If a thousand is deposited in such a plan and the interest is left to accumulate, how much is in the account after one year? When you do simple interest, they calculate the interest one time and one time only. When you do compound interest, they will calculate the interest and then they will add that back to whatever it is you borrowed. Let's see, this is, okay, now this is a savings plan. So you're sticking a grand in an account, you're leaving it there for a year, but quarterly, which means four times a year, they're gonna calculate the interest. So down here, they're showing that. They start with the thousand, it's at 2% and it's the first quarter of the year. So one fourth of the year, that comes out to be five bucks. Now what they'll do is they will take the $5 and now you'll have $1,005 in your account. So then another three months goes by, right? Four goes into 12, three times. Yeah, so every three months they'll recalculate. But this time they're gonna calculate it on $1,005. And you'll see, ooh, look at that. You're getting an extra three cents. You're just racking up the money fast here. So they do it again. <laughs> and then they add that number onto the 1,005, which is they're showing here. So now you're up to $1,010 and three cents. Okay, then another three months goes by and they use that number times 0.02 times the next quarter. And now you're up to an additional $5.05. You just earned another two cents worth of interest. And they add that to this number, whew, which will give them this number, 1,015.08. And now you're on the last quarter and they calculate it again and you get an additional 508 and they add that to this. And now you've got $1,020.16. That's how compound interest works. It literally compounds. They calculate it and then they add it back. Now, if you're the one earning the money, this is great. But if they do this when you borrow money, it's not so great, especially if they compound it daily or compound it continuously. That can rack up really fast. So, um, no, you are not gonna have to do it like this where you keep, <laughs> keep calculating it and adding because this was just quarterly for one year. What if this had been quarterly for 20 years? Four times 20, uh, I would have had to have done, done this 80 times. I don't think so. There is a formula for compound interest and here it is. Um, the amount A, and this is actually your future amount. How much will you have in this account? P is still principal, little r is still your interest rate, and T is still your time, but now you've got a new variable in here, and this is the letter N, and N is the number of times they compound it per year. So if they say quarterly, that's four times a year. If they say semi-annually, that would be two times a year. 
if they say monthly, that's 12 times a year. I think you get the idea. If they just want it once a year, they'll say annually. Annually is one time per year. And then when they say daily, uh, do whatever my math lab tells you. I've had some books that say 365 and other books that'll say 360. I don't know why. So I just tell people, do whatever my math lab tells you. And so when you have this NT up here, like on that last one, it was four times a year for one year. Four times one was four. They calculated it four times. This was the first calculation. And then this was the second, and this was the third, and this was the fourth, four times, so. All right, so you'll need that formula, and I'll do one example of that. Uh, find the amount that results from the given investment. It's $400 invested at 4% compounded quarterly after a period of three years. So the formula was A is equal to P times one plus R over N raised to the N T. And the $400, that's your P. The 4%, that is your rate. Um, it says compounded quarterly. Compounded quarterly, that's your N, which would be four times a year. And then this is T, which is three years. So I gotta take out all the players and put them in. So P is 400. R, which is 4%, would be 0.04 divided by four, and then raised to the four times three power. Now for your all's calculator, um, I did some intermediate steps here. I went ahead and did everything that was in the parentheses. 0.04 divided by four and then added one. I just did order of operations. That's 1.01 .01, and then raised to the four times three power is 12. And then I did the exponent next and I multiplied by 400 last. And then it does say round to the nearest cent. So I got $450 and when I took it to the nearest penny, it was 73 cents. So if you put $400 in some type of an investment and you come back three years later, you'll still have all $400 as you should. If it's less than $400, either you did something wrong or your bank did, and I'd be speaking to your bank. <clears throat> okay. All right, now, continuous compounding. Um, this is something we do a lot in the calculus classes, but continuousing is like literally every second. And this is where E comes in, and I won't go into great detail about why it works, but this is the formula. Um, I refer to it as the PERT formula, kind of like PERT shampoo, if you remember that shampoo. Um, but the amount after T years of a principal P invested at an annual interest rate R con compounded continuously. And that's where E comes into play. And then they gave a quick example here. Here's the formula. And they said a principal of a thousand. So here's the thousand and an annual interest rate of 10%. So they put the 10% where the R is and T was one year. So 0.10 times one is 0.10. And then they calculated e to the point 10 and got this number and then multiplied it times a thousand and got that. It's the easiest formula to work with. It's pretty much just plug and chug. Very simple. So here's number nine that asks for compounding continuously. And I can see it right here. If it says compounded quarterly, compounded monthly, compounded whatever, you use that other compound formula with the R over N raised to the NT. But if it says continuously, that's the PERT formula, all right? All 
Okay, now on this problem, it says find the principal. That means we're looking for P. Find the principal needed now to get the now to get the given amount that would be a remember this is p that's a um, and that is find the present value so we're going to get 110 dollars that's a so 110 goes right there p is what i'm looking for e is a standard number the rate is 10%, so that would be 0.10 times the number of years, and the number of years is two and a half years, but since I'm using my handy dandy calculator, I'm gonna call it 2.5 years. Now, I just gotta solve for P. First things first though, I'm gonna make my exponent a little prettier. I'm gonna take 0.10 raised to the 2.5 power, and that's gonna be a 0 0.25. Now if 110 equals P times E to the 0 0.025, if I want to solve for um, P, wouldn't you have to divide off the e to the 0 0.25 so that they cancel? And of course, what you do to one side, you gotta do to the other. Now, as far as your calculator is concerned, on your calculator, I'm gonna have to type in the 110 first then hit the division sign. Then for your calculator, you have to give it the exponent of 0.25, then hit your second button, then hit the natural log button, and it'll put the 0.25 where the X is on the E to the X, and then hit equals. And that is going to give you, and of course, it is round to the nearest cent. So it's going to be $85 and 67 cents. And then another one. This one says, how many years will it take for initial investment of 10 grand to grow to 2,500? Assume a rate of interest of 4% compounded continuously. As soon, as soon as I see continuously, I immediately think A equals P E to the R T. Now, we have an initial investment of 10,000. That's what I am investing, so that's my P. And then it's gonna grow to 25,000. That's the future amount, A. And then, let's see, assume it's 4%, that is little r, and we are looking for, how many years, that's what we're looking for, that's T. So in this formula, I am gonna put the 25,000 where the A is. I'm gonna leave P in the problem. E is just, you know, a given E. R is 4%, so that's 0.04, I'm sorry, P is not P. P was 10 grand, come on April, wake up. P was 10,000, E is E, R is 0.04, and T is what we're looking for, which makes this an exponential equation. So you either have to solve it exponentially or solve it using logarithms, and I feel logarithms, I see logarithms in your future. 
Um, first thing I'm going to do, however, is divide off the 10,000 from both sides. Those cancel. And this is going to be 2.5 equals e to the 0.04 t. And now we're going to leave exponent land and travel to log land. So pack your bags, dress warmly, it's cold outside. And remember that your exponent, this exponent of 0.04t, that will equal, and since it's base e, we're doing natural logs of the 2.5. And then to solve for t, I would divide off the 0.04. And then I just grab my calculator and on your calculator, you have to type in the 2.5 first, then hit your natural log button, then hit the divide button, then type in a 0.04 and then hit your equals button. And T comes out to be 22.9072, blah, 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 blah. And it says round to two decimal places. So uh, the nine is the first, the, ten, the zero is the second. And because that's a seven, this is gonna become 22.91 years. So it's gonna take 22 years for your 10,000 to grow to 15,000. And so that's that. Those are the simple interest, compound interest, and continuous compounding formulas. And now we're going to learn about two other formulas. Um, these are called the effective rates of return. Okay, um, the effective rate of interest R of an investment earning an annual interest rate R is given by these little formulas. If you went into a bank and you're like, hey, I need a certain interest rate and, they're, and you're like, and I want compounding blah, blah, blah so that I get a certain amount of money and they're like, we're sorry, we're not offering compound interest rate. We only offer simple. Well, these formulas would help you figure out what interest rate would I need at simple interest that'll give me the same amount of money that I would earn on compound interest at the rate I wanted? That's basically what these formulas do. And it's just plugging in the formula. So I think there's only one or two in your homework. It says find the effective rate of interest for 22% compounded continuously. Now I'm seeing the word compound is continuously here, but it didn't ask me for future value. It said, find the effective rate. So I have to go back to this formula page and I'm looking for the effective rate of interest for continuous compounding. So I need this formula. So I need the rate of the effective, that's what that little E stands for. Did they use an E or a funky E? What do they use? Yeah, that little E just means effective. It really bugs me when they write it like that. I wish they would use a capital E because little E is usually set aside for the 2.7 blah, blah, blah number. So it's effective rate. And then here is the E that you'll use on your calculator, E to the R and then minus one. So this is going to be e to the, it said 22%, that would be 0.22. So on your calculator, you're going to type in the 0.22. Then you're going to have to hit your second button and then hit your natural log because it has e to the x as its second function. And then just hit the subtraction sign and the one and then your equal sign and it should spit out 0 0.24607673. Now, 
they want a percentage. So the first thing I'm going to have to do is convert this decimal to a percentage by moving the decimal point two places to the right. That now gives me 24.6076731. And now it says round it to three decimal places. So one, two, three. This is the third decimal place because that's a six that seven will go up to an eight. So my final answer is 24.608 and that would be a percent. Of course, my math lab's got the percent there for you. But that's your answer. And that's all there is to those. Which then brings me to, okay. Um, these formulas here, you don't have to memorize. They're called present value formulas. Of course, you don't have to memorize them anyway. You don't have to use them if you don't want to because I showed you, where was it? Back on problem number, where was it? It's where they asked me to find P. Yeah, it was this one. Um, this one said, find the principal needed now to give a future amount. If they say, find what you need right now, you're in the present. So they call that the present value. It's kind of like, it's kind of like when my kids were born, I should have said to myself, how much money should I invest right now? So that in 18 years, when they go off to college, I'll have some money for them to go to college. <laughs> yeah, every parent should do that, but we don't. Anyway, you can, you know, I did use the same formula. I just put, you know, the money where the A is, the given amount that was given, and then I just use algebra to solve for P. What these formulas do is they took it and solved it for P. So like, I'll just do the compound continuous one. They've got, they took the A equals P E to the R T and since you're solving for P, they divided the E to the RT on both sides so that that cancels. So what I'm looking at is, okay, the P equals A over E to the RT, but then they decided, you know what, let's bring the E to the RT up. But if you do the reciprocal, doesn't that make your exponent negative? And then it just makes it so it's plugging and chugging and you don't have to do any algebra. You can use these if you want or you don't have to use them. You can just use the algebra like I did on that previous one. Um, like this one says, find the principal needed now to get the given amount, that is find the present value. So if I did want to use the formula for present value, it says compounded monthly. So for that one, compounded monthly, I would be using this guy. So P is equal to A times one plus R over N raised to the negative NT. And then just put in all the players. A is the future amount to get $100, that's my A. And then one plus my interest rate, uh, it's 5%, so that's 0 0.05. And then it says compounded monthly, compounded monthly, that's 12 times a year. This is my N, N equals 12. And then of course that's gonna be raised to the 12 times a year for the next two years. Oh, don't forget your negative, April. It's negative 12. So a lot of times when I'm doing this, I'll do some intermediate steps. So I went ahead and took 0.05 divided by 12 and added it to one, and that gave me an obnoxious decimal. That's as much as my calculator screen would hold. And then negative 12 times two is negative 24. And then I just went from there. And it does say round to the nearest cent. So to the nearest penny we're looking at 
$90.50. Now, if you're going for present value, your answer should be smaller than the future value. It's like, how much money do you need to invest now so that it'll grow to be $100? I surely hope I don't have to invest a thousand to get a hundred later. Something's going on with my bank on that one. So just pay attention to your answer and see, does that make sense? Now, if you use the A equals P times one plus RN raised to the positive NT, you're just gonna have to do a division, a division step when you're done, the last step. It works either way. And then this one says, Jerome will be buying a used car for nine grand in two years. How much money should he ask his parents, oh, isn't that nice, for now, <laughs> so that if he invests it at 5% compounded continuously, he will have enough to buy the car. Okay, so he will be buying, will be buying, that's the future amount A, that future amount is 9,000, and the time is in two years, and parents, that's funny, 5%, that's your rate, but that would be 0.05, and it does say compounding continuously, but it's the future value, so I'm gonna go with P equals AE to the negative RT, and I'm looking for P, and it's $9,000 in the future, and negative, the rate was 0.05, and we're going to take that times 2. So I like to simplify my exponent, that would be negative 0.10, and then I plug and chug and round off to the nearest cent. So he's going to go to his parents and say, hey, can I have $8,143.54, please? I'm gonna go put it in the bank and let it sit there for two years. And when I come back, I'll have an extra, whatever the difference is between 9,000 and that number. Under $1,000, but hey, money's money. All right, and then the last thing is uh, determine the rate of interest or the time required to either double a lump sum of money. They might ask you to triple it sometimes. Um, here's an example of theirs. I'm just going to leave it in there for you to look at later. I'm going to go through one of the, my math lab questions. Um, what rate of interest compounded annually is required to triple an investment in seven years? Um, I see right here it says compounded annually. I need the compound formula. It doesn't say compounded continuously. So I need the A equals P times one plus R over N raised to the NT formula. And annually means N is one. Now, we're looking for R. We also know that our time T is seven. So I got a number for T, a number for N. I'm looking for little r. There are no other numbers in this problem. What the heck do I put in place of A and P? Well, it says required to triple an investment, triple an investment. My investment is P. If you triple the investment, that would be 3P. If you triple something, you multiply by three. So I don't know what P is, Whatever your investment is, it doesn't matter. Are you investing $100? Are you investing $500? Are you investing $1,000? You're trying to figure out what rate you need so that your investment, whatever it is, will be three times what it is in the future. So put leave P where it is and put 3P where A is. If it says double, 
I would put a 2p where a is. If it says five times as much, I'd put a 5p where a is. And then this is one plus little r is what I'm looking for. N is one. And then it's one times t, which is seven. Now, here's the cool part. If I take this entire mess on the right and divide it by P, since P is multiplied by right here, they cancel out. But what you do to one side, you gotta do the other. Cancels out over there also. Ooh, neat trick. So really what I have is three is equal to one plus R divided by one is R raised to the one times seven is seven. And now you have to solve for R. Well, R is inside the parentheses, but the parentheses are raised to the seventh power. So I am going to seventh root it. And what you do to one side, you gotta do to the other. So I'm gonna seventh root the three. Follow me. Um, I'm not gonna calculate seventh root of three yet. I'm just gonna write it down. So I'll have whatever the seventh root of three is on the left and on the right, the seventh root and the power of seven cancel out, meaning I don't need those parentheses anymore. And then to solve for R, wouldn't you just subtract over the one? So it's gonna be the seventh root of three and then subtract one. It'd be at this point, I'll grab my calculator and do the whole thing. And that's going to give me 0 0.169930813. However, my math lab up here has this percentage. So I have to move the decimal place over two. That's going to make it 16.99309. And then I have to round that to two decimal places. So 0.993. So my final answer in this box is going to be 16.99. And that is the end of that section. Um, if you want to know how to do it on your calculator, um, this right here for the calculator. You're going to hit the three first, then you hit your second button, then you hit your Y to the X button because above it, it has the X root of Y key or Y root of X, no X root of Y. And then tell it you want the seventh root and then hit a subtraction sign, a number one, and then the equals two, and it should spit out that number. And that is 6.7. Questions on any of that? Am I still there? I didn't lose anybody, did I? <sighs> I think I'm still connected. Yep, I'm still connected. All right, and this is the last section that I'm gonna cover. Oh, I know you guys are getting all choked up out there. Yeah, all right. Um, there's only five questions in your homework. And those five questions actually cover all four of these objectives. Um, you're gonna look at populations where it looks at growth and then also at decay. And then you're gonna cover a formula for the Newton's law of cooling. And the last one is a formula that you use uh, for a logistic model. So uh, growth and decay is what we're gonna start with. Here's those exponential pictures. Um, we've seen exponential formulas before, 
where it shoots up to the right or it shoots down. The only difference is, is when we were doing ours, we looked at the entire graph. So our graph went all along here and then shot up. You'll notice that these start at zero because that's always your starting amount at time zero. We're looking to see from the, 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 the point where it starts to grow, that's time zero, or the point that it starts to decay is time zero. So the, these will always be in quadrant number one, all right? And basically it looks like this. Um, it looks, it really looks like the PERT formula if you think about it. It says A equals P E to the RT, except instead of A, they used functional notation of N of T. Instead of P, they used N sub zero, which means your initial amount. There is the E. Instead of R, they use a K, which is called, uh, it's a constant of, it's either your growth constant or your decay constant. The growth constant, it would be positive. If it's a decay, it would be negative. That's the only difference. But it's basically the same formula. All the players are the same. It's just how you interpret it. So an example of this is number one, the size P of a certain insect population at time T in days obeys the function P of T equals 600 E to the 0.03 T. It says determine the number of insects at T is equal to zero days. Well, T is equal to zero days. That's this number right here. Because if you stuck zero where T was, 0 0.03 times zero is zero and e to the zero is one, and one times 600 is 600. So when they put n sub zero, that means it's your initial amount at time equals zero. So there's 600 insects to begin with. And then when it asks you, what is the growth rate of the population? That is the k. So when I look in this formula right here, this is my K, that is my growth rate. It's positive, so it's a growth. And they have 0.03, so you're just gonna change 0.03, move the decimal two places to the right, and it would be 3%. Those are easy. Now, when you get to part C, it says, what is the population after 10 days? And this is just a plug and a chug type of a problem. The formula was, what was, did they use P's? P of whatever, hang on, was it P? Yeah, P of T. P of time, and they're saying the time is 10 days. So I'm just gonna calculate P of 10. So it was 600 E to the 0 0.03 times 10. And that's me and my calculator. And when I get done, let's see, do not round until the final answer, round to the nearest whole number. I ended up with 809.91, blah, 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 blah. Can you show how you put that in on your computer? The sure. key sequence? So I end up with 810 insects. Um, on the calculator, you would, first I would, First thing I would do is take 0 0.03 times 10, and that's going to be 0 0.3. So I'm going to type in the 0.3. Then I'm going to hit my second button. Hit your natural log button because it's e to the x. And then hit, um, that'll give you, that'll put the 0.3 where the e to the x is, it should calculate it. And then go ahead and hit your multiplication sign and the 600 and then the equal to. And that's it. Um, and then D says, when will the population reach 840 insects? 
So in this one, they're giving me the future amount of the insects. So the 840 goes where the P of T is. There were 600 initially. It's still 0.03, but now I'm calculating T because T is the time and we're looking for the number of days. So we're looking for T, which means this has got to be solved exponentially. So I'm going to start by dividing by 600. Those cancel. 840 divided by 600 is 1.4. And now you're going to leave exponent land and travel to log land. Because I'm dealing with base E, I have to do a natural log. The natural log of the 1.4 is going to equal the exponent of 0.3t. And then you divide off the 0.03 to get t by itself. And at this point, it's me and my calculator. So on this one, you would, well, let me just do it. It's, um, I get 11.21574, blah, blah, blah. And they want me to go to the nearest tenth and since the two is the tenths position, my answer is gonna be 11.2. So in this box is 11.2 days. Um, as far as the calculator is concerned for calculating that, for this right here, you would type in the 1.4, hit your natural log button, hit your division sign, 0.03 and then hit your equal to. And that should give it to you. So in 11.2 days, those 600 bugs are now at 840. Not in my backyard, maybe zero. <laughs> Get me some chickens, eat those bugs. Oh, we're still not done with this. Part E. When will the insect population double? Okay, well, we how many bugs did we start off with? 600, right? 600 insects, if you double, wouldn't that be 1,200? So 1,200 equals 600 E to the 0.03 T. But of course, if you divide 600 into 1200, don't you just get two? So two equals 0.03t. If you're good and you remember, you know, about this doubling thing, you can just start with this. When will the e to the 0.03t equal a two? Because the two represents the doubling. And then of course, this is exponential. So I'm gonna convert it to logarithmic my exponent of 0.03t will equal, remember base E is the natural log, there's really a base E right here, of the two. And then just divide by 0.03, so t is gonna equal natural log of two divided by 0.03. And they want this round to the nearest tenth, when I did it, I got 23.104, blah, blah, blah. So to the nearest tenth, 23.1 days. It's only going to take 23.1 days for this sucker to double. <sighs> Get your raid. All right, so that is growth. And then the next is decay, but it's basically the exact same formula, except you're dealing with a K that is less than zero, which means negative. <clears throat> which makes sense, because, you know, it's decaying. So I just went straight to a, a math lab question. It was number two. This one dealt with decay. Um, the first two First question is, what is the decay rate? What is the decay rate? Um, I look at my formula up here, and whatever my negative exponent is, that is the decay rate. 
And it does say down here, type an integer or a decimal, include the negative sign for the decay rate. Now, what I'm seeing is negative 0.0244. However, my math lab has a percent sign right there. So I'm going to have to move it two places to the right. And now my answer is 2 point. 4% and that is what I'll put in this box right there. Um, part B says approximately how many grams of this strontium 90 is left after 20 years. Okay, they want to know how much will be there in 20 years. So we're looking for A of T on this. A of T and T is 20 years. So we're calculating A of 20. Um, the initial amount, uh, where's that? I'm going to go back and read my problem because A sub zero is the initial amount. Assume a scientist has a sample of 400 grams. That's what we started with, 400 grams. And then it's e to the, where was my, oh, they gave me that. That's the negative 0 0.0244. And then we plug in the 20 right there. So it's me and my calculator. Okay, um, I actually did the exponent first. I got a negative 0.488 and just be careful you have to type in the 0.488 button or number first and then hit that plus minus sign on the bottom of your calculator next to your equal sign to get the negative in there. Do not use the subtraction sign. That won't work. You'll get an error message. So I get 245 point five, four, blah, blah, blah. And they want it to the nearest whole number. So 246, 246 grams will be left over. And then C says, when will only 100 grams of this strontium 90 be left? When, so now when is time. When will this happen? So my future value is 100 grams. It started out at 400 and then it's still negative point. Oh, where is it? Oh, two, four, four. But I'm looking for T. So I'm back to exponential equation. I'll have to use logarithms. I'm first going to divide off this 400 though. And 100 divided by 400 is 0.25. And then we're going to leave exponent land and go to log land. So the exponent is going to equal the natural log of the 0.25. And then all you have to do is divide off that negative 0.0244 to get T by itself. And that is going to give me, let's see, do not round until the final answer and then round to the nearest tenth. So I ended up with 56.81. So rounding's nearest tenth would make it eight. So 56.8 years. Takes a while to decay stuff, apparently. Now, on the previous problem where we were doing growth, we were looking at when things doubled. Well, if they're decaying, they're more interested in what they call the half-life, which simply means half of what it was before the half-life of strontium 90 is approximately how many years? 
it was 400. Initially, there was 400, right? So the half-life, I thought I just switched that to green. Come on, there we go. The half-life, half of the 400 would equal 200. So I would be saying 200 is equal to 400 E to the negative 0.0244 T. And of course, when you divide by 400, 400 goes into 200 one half times, you get that 0.5. So if you understood what I was saying about doubling, you can do the same thing with the half-life. Just take the e to the whatever and set it equal to 0.5. Because you are looking for half. How long does it take to decay down to half of what it was to begin with? And then of course we have to leave exponent land and go to log land and the exponent of negative 0.0244t will equal the natural log of the 0.5. And so t is gonna be the natural log of 0.5 divided by the negative 0.0244. And this one also wants it to the nearest tenth. And nearest tenth on that one is 28.4. So it'll take 28.4 years to be half of what it was. Which if I look at the problem before that, it took 56 years to get down to one quarter of what it was. So 28, that's about right. All right, so that's that. And then we move on to the use of Newton's law of cooling. And this is the formula for Newton's law of cooling. The temperature U of a heated object at a given time T can be modeled by the following function where T is the constant temperature of the surrounding medium U sub zero is the initial temperature of the heated object, and K, that's a negative constant. And they even put right here, K is less than zero. So I went straight to my math lab and grabbed the only question that covers this. Um, it says a pizza pan is removed at 7 p.m. from an oven whose temperature is fixed at 425 degrees into a room that is a constant 72 degrees Fahrenheit. After five minutes, the pizza pan is at 300. Question A is, at what time is the temperature of the pan 125 degrees? Well, my equation was U of T equals capital T plus U sub zero minus capital T E raised to the K T. Okay. <clears throat> um, T is the constant, let me go back here. T is the constant temperature of the surrounding medium. That would be the temperature of the room and it says it is put into a room that is a constant 72 degrees. That is T. So 72 goes here and 72 goes there. Then we've got U sub zero. Let's see. U sub zero is the initial temperature of the heated object. U sub zero is the initial temperature of the heated object. And it was removed from the oven and it was heated up to 425 degrees. That's my U sub zero. That goes right there. And then it tells me what the time was and what the temperature was after that time. It says after five minutes, 
This would be my T, so five is gonna go here. I have no idea what K is, but after five minutes, the pan cooled down to 300 degrees. U of T, that is the temperature after so much time has gone by. The temperature U of a heated object at a given time T can be modeled by the following functions. So U of T is what the temperature is after T time has gone by. So that is the, need one more color. It's yellow. Uh, the pan is at 300 degrees after five minutes. So 300 goes right here. The only letter I have left is K. That's the constant that I don't know. So I'm gonna solve this for K. So I'm gonna have 300 equals 72 plus, I'm gonna start with 525 minus 72. That is 353 and that'll be E to the K times five. It looks better when I write it 5K. I'm gonna subtract the 72 from both sides. So that cancels. I get 228 is equal to 353e to the 5k. I'm then gonna divide off the 353, which is gonna give me an ugly number, so I'm just gonna leave it for now. So right now I have whatever 228 divided by 353 is equal to e to the 5k. I cannot solve this exponentially, so we're gonna use logarithms. The exponent of 5k will equal, because it's e, it's natural log of the 228 divided by 353, which means k will be the natural log of 228 divided by 353, all divided by five. And this does not come out pretty, but it does come out negative because it's supposed to be negative. I get a negative 0 0.087424486. Now, what I'm gonna do to make this easy, I'm gonna put this number in a little bubble. That is K, okay? That is K. And I've run out of room, so I'm gonna have to add another slide here. I'm still on part A, all right? We're still on part A. Now that I know K, I can go back up to the line in the formula that says, um, the set, well, the U of T is going to equal the 72 plus, and then of course 425 minus 72 is 353, and now I know that it is E to the KT, the K number goes right here, and then you still have the T. I have now figured out what K is for this particular problem. And now I can figure out after 12 minutes, what's the temperature of my pizza, or after eight minutes, or after 30 minutes, or you know, whatever. Um, by using this formula right here. Once I figured out K, I have a new U of T. It's 72 plus 353 E raised to the, that obnoxious K number, which I'm too lazy to write down again, so I just used the cloud <laughs> to represent it, times T. And now I can answer their question because it says, what time is the temperature of the pan 125 degrees? So I can now put the 125 right here, and that is equal to 72 plus 353 E raised to that ugly negative number T. 
I will then subtract the 72 on both sides. That cancels. I get 53 equals the 353e raised to the k number times t. And then of course you'll divide by the 353. Still raised to that number t. And now you're gonna leave exponent land, go to log land, and the exponent, which was that obnoxious k number times t, is going to equal the natural log of the 53 over 353. And so to solve for t, I just have to divide by the, the cloud number that represents k. <laughs> so t is going to equal the natural log of 53 over 353 divided by that ugly number that I had before. And that ugly number was negative 0 0.08742 That's what's in the cloud here. And they wanted it to, let's see. Do not round until the final answer, then round to the nearest minute as needed. So when I got done, I had 21.689, and so to the nearest minute would be 22 minutes. But your answer isn't 22, because it says the temperature of the pan is 125 degrees at blank PM. Well, if you go back and look, it said that they removed the pan at 7 p.m. This was 22 minutes later, so your answer would be 7.22 p.m. That's my final answer, just a part A. That was quite involved. And then part B is a little easier. Um, how many minutes need to elapse before the pan is 150? So you're going to put the 150 where the U of T is because that's its temperature after X number of minutes and we're looking for the number of minutes. And you would use the 72 plus 353 e to the negative point zero eight seven four two four four eight six now you know why i used a cloud before t because i get tired of writing that number over and over again um you're gonna subtract 72 that's going to give you 78 equals 353 e to the da 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 t you'll divide by the 353, which is e to the da 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 t. You're going to leave exponent land and go to log land. So the da 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 t is going to equal the natural log of 78 over 353. And then you're going to divide by the da 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 or the yada, 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 or the blah, 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 if you're a uh, Seinfeld fan. Let's see, this was negative 0 0.087424486. Whew. And do not round until the final answer and then round to the nearest minute as needed. And they do want minutes here. So when I'm Dividing, I get 17.269 blah, blah, blah to the nearest minute would be 17 minutes. And that is the answer there. And it says, what do you notice about the temperature as time passes? Well, as time goes on, the pizza is going to get cooler and cooler and cooler. So it's actually approaching the room temperature of 72 degrees. That's what the room temperature was right here, right there, 72 degrees. 
Okay, and I'm already a minute over, but I got one last concept to cover. Um, it's logistic models, and it is this formula here. Um, and there's only one problem, it's my math lab number five. So I'm gonna continue to just do this last example. And if you need to bug out, you need to bug out. If you can stay, you can stay. It'll probably only take me five minutes, maybe, if even that. Um, a logistic model involves population. We're looking for the population after time t is given by the function p of t equals c over blah, 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 blah. A, B, and C are constants. Both A and C have to be greater than zero, positive. The model is a growth model if B is greater than zero or it's a decay model if B is less than zero. So we're looking at populations if they're gonna grow or if they're gonna stop growing, ungrow populations. Um, the next slide simply shows what the uh, picture would look like in a graph of this function. And you can see that for growth here, it's, it's obviously going uphill, but it, it'll, um, it'll taper off at the top. And if you're looking at uh, DK, it's actually going downhill and eventually does taper off also. Um, this slide just gives you a lot of stuff about the graph and inflection points and all that, but you're, you're just going to have to pick um, from the pictures. And if it's growth, it goes uphill. If it's decay, it goes downhill. It's just that easy. So I won't go into any more detail than that. So on number five, you've got this formula. It represents the percentage of households that do not own a personal computer T years since 1987. Now that's the year I graduated from college and computers were just taken off back then. If, if I knew then what I know now, I would have gotten a degree in computer science and I'd be a millionaire right now, but hanging out with, you know, Bill Gates maybe. Anyway, um, part A says evaluate and interpret P of zero. Well, if you put zero where the T is, which is right here, if you put zero there, 0 0.150, whatever it is, times zero is zero, and then E to the zero is a one. So really what I'm gonna have is 91.9579 over one plus, that number would be 1.0435. And when I divide that, I get 88.124 round to one decimal place. So 88.1, and this is already in percent form. Um, you'll notice that there's a percent sign here. And I didn't move the decimal two places and say 8,810%. That's because the logistic model P of T represents the percentage. The answer is already in percent form. So once you're done, you're done on this. So 88.1 just goes in this box. And then it says, which sentence below best describes P of zero? P of zero is the percentage of households without a personal computer starting at 19, 1987. That's where we started. Time equals zero is where you begin and we began in 1987 and there were two A and C that involved 1987, but A says it was households with a personal computer we started did not own a personal computer so that would be a without to a personal computer and then they pop up the next and they're like hey well which graph would it be well if you don't have a computer as time goes on more and more houses got the computers didn't they the number of years since and the percentage of households it should go, oh wait, the, what percentage of households did not own a 
the personal, con oh, that's part C, sorry. Uh, choose the correct graph. Yeah, the percentage of households, oh, this is a trick question. Uh, we're still considering the households that do not. So a lot of people did not have computers, but as time goes on, the number of people that do not have them went down. So it's actually choice B. It's a trick question because they said do not have computers. As time goes on, more people have them. So the percentage that don't have them goes down. Yeah, sneaky. Um, and then C wants to know what percentages of households did not own a computer in 1995. So let's figure out how much time has gone by first. 1995 minus 1987. We're looking at eight years have gone by. So I'm gonna go and I'm gonna calculate P of eight in that formula. So I'm just plugging and chugging. So 91.9579 over one plus 0.0435E raised to the one, the point one five oh six, And here's where the eight gets plugged in in T. And then it's me and my calculator doing the math. And ultimately when I'm done and it says round to one decimal place, I get 80.3% and you don't have to move the decimal point because it's already in terms of percentages. Okay, which brings me to the last part D and this one says in what year? will the percentage of households that do not own a computer reach 10%? <coughs> They're giving me the percentage. So that is my P of T. The percentage in what year is going to be 10%. The 10 goes right there. That's this here. And again, that formula, I'm gonna write it down, 91.9579 over one plus, all right, now this one's a little bit fun because you gotta solve it algebraically. Um, I'm solving for T and T is in the denominator so I'm gonna have to clear out my fraction. So I am going to multiply both sides by the denominator of one plus 0.0435e to the 0.1506t. Whew. And then what you do to one side, you gotta do to the other. So I'm gonna do the same thing over here, the one plus 0.04 blah, 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 all that crap over there too. Um, it will cancel out on the right. This cancels that. So I'll be left with the 91.9579 on the right. On the left, I'm going to have to distribute to get rid of the parentheses. So 10 times 1 is 10 and 10 times all that crap. Let's see, 10 times a point oh is going to make it a 0.435e to the 0.1506t when I distribute. Then I'm going to subtract 10 off both sides. Subtract 10, subtract 10. That'll cancel. I'm going to have to add another slide here. When I subtract 10, let's see, I'm gonna have the 0.435e to the 0.1506t on the left and subtract 10 from the right and that's 81.9575. And then the next thing I'm gonna do is divide off the 0.435 
And then I'm going to convert it from exponential to logarithmic. The exponent of 0.1506t will equal the natural log of this obnoxious fraction right here. And then to solve for t, I would divide off the 0 0.1506. So me and my calculator are going to do this math here. And when I am done, I'm going to have 34.784. But the question says, in what year? Now, if you're at 34.784, and right now it's 1987, if you add 1987 plus 34.784, you're into the year 2021, almost to the year 2022, but you won't count that part because you haven't reached 2022 yet. You're about three fourths the way into 2021. So 2021 is your answer. And now I'm done. Okay, I took a little bit more than five minutes, but Questions on anybody out there? Is anybody still there? Yep, oh, I still got a few. Woohoo! My diehard fans. <laughs> Did I go too fast? No, nah, I caught everything. I'm good. Good news is, is I'm recording it, and after I process it, you know, if you miss something, you can always go back and watch that part again. Or if you're having trouble sleeping, it might help you do that. When did you say yeah, we uh, put get the uh, review to go over? Um, when do we put that on the web? I might start working on it tonight. By Friday, I should have it done. All right. And we'll go over that Monday? Yes. Okay. All right. Yep. And I'll be posting an announcement, too. I haven't had a chance to look at the final to see how many questions there are and all that kind of stuff. So I'll let you know that stuff, too. Wisdom. Anything else? Thank you. Bye. When is the final due date? Uh, when is the final due date uh, for the homework? Is it Monday or is it Wednesday? I think I gave you till Tuesday night. I think I gave you till 11.59 p.m. on the 15th. Let me see real quick if I've got my, my math lab open. Wait, the homework's due on the 15th? Hang on, let me look. I've got it set for, nope, I'm sorry, the 13th. But I can change that if you need more time. I would like a bit more time, yes. Okay. <laughs> What's today? Yeah, I've got it set for Sunday, but we're going to be reviewing on my, I can give you until the night before the final, so I'll switch it to the 15th. It's only five sections, Ben. What's wrong? <laughs> uh, well. <laughs> Let's just say I would like a bit more time. <laughs> no problem. I will change it as soon as I log off. <laughs> <laughs> All right, is that it? Bye. Have a good night. <laughs>